Hello, everyone. Um, it's exciting to be here. Um, I don't think I've ever presented at 24 Hours of Chaos before. I can't remember if I did. Um, but uh, in any case, um, Albana asked me to do a short talk. So um, I chose a few topics that I think might be interested, interesting for um, everyone. So let's go ahead and uh, let me share my screen. And um, hopefully you can see it now. We can see yep. it. OK, perfect. So it's just rendering stuff, nothing specific, just a bunch of topics which I thought would be um, cool to mention. Uh, these topics are um, uh, the ones that you see here on the screen. And um, the first one is about something that we call uh, the Innovation Lab. It's uh, something relatively new for, for Chaos that we decided to do um, this year. It's uh, basically a framework that would allow us to structure the um, so-called in innovation in our company a little better than we have done uh, so far. Um, I think that, that if we were not an innovative company, we wouldn't be around for, for so long. Um, but so far, things have generally happened in a rather random way with people just having ideas and then uh, somehow deciding to pursue them. But um, I want to build a more, uh, more uh, formal framework around this. My personal view is that good ideas for our products and for new products in general can come from anywhere. They can come from customers, but also from people inside the company. And um, the idea, at least my goal, is to be able to collect as many of these ideas as possible, um, no matter where they come from. And also give everybody an opportunity to um, participate in implementing those ideas, at least the ones that we decide are, are worth investigating. Um, what we'll probably end up doing is we'll, our planning in the company is based on six months period. So period. So every six months we would sit down, take a look at what um, topics we've gathered um, and decide on maybe five or six topics to look into in, in more detail. And these would usually be topics that uh, we don't know whether they're going to work or not. So we need to spend some time tinkering with, with code uh, and checking the results and see whether it's useful or not. Um, since at least so far, what we've been mostly doing is rendering, it will be natural that, that most of these topics are also based around rendering. But um, also, it's interesting to try things related to AI, uh, neural networks, which uh, I personally am very interested in. But uh, because of all the other things that I have to do, I haven't really had a lot of time to experiment with this. And hopefully, in the framework of the Innovation Lab, we'll have a little bit of time to look into those things as well. Um, and uh, the other topic, completely random and non-connected, is the um, NMesh feature that we added in, in V-Ray 6. If you don't know what it is, it's basically a volumetric texture. You take a piece of 3D geometry and then you tile it along a, a surface. It's not like instancing, however, because the, the surface can deform and the uh, reference geometry can deform with it. The implementation that we used for, uh, for V-Ray NMesh is based on the 2D displacement that we've had in V-Ray for a long, long time. Uh, only instead of a bitmap, like a height field that's based on a bitmap, you um, take a, an actual piece of geometry to replicate. It's not a new idea. Um, the original um, idea is described in a paper from 1998. And actually, when I was looking for a way to implement displacement in V-Ray, um, I read this paper maybe like more than 20 years ago. And I, my thought was, well, I don't need actual 3D geometry. I would, I, I would just need a height field. Um, and that's what I did to make the 2D displacement uh, in V-Ray work. But in the back of my mind, the idea was that at some point, we would always go back to implement the full, uh, the full solution with uh, polymetric textures uh, supporting arbitrary geometry. And we did start working on this um, at some point, maybe a few years ago. Um, but we didn't really finish it because of other things that were going on. So the code has been there for a while, basically gathering dust. And for v 6, we decided to finally um, take it out of the closet and uh, brush it up and, and put it into an official release of v 8 um, 
it does have a few uh, caveats, so it's not as easy as regular texturing. And uh, first, when you curve the, 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 the issue that the problem is you can actually uh, warp the geometry. It's not, a, it's not a flat surface anymore. This is a, a problem because rays that are straight in world space end up being curved in the texture space. Um, also, surface normals are a little bit tricky to calculate without artifacts. There are other solutions for volumetric textures, but usually if you look at the normals, you, you will see discontinuities. Uh, for Vuri, we wanted to really make this perfect, so we spent a lot of time on this. And also another um, hurdle was that the shading properties like UV coordinates uh, for uh, texture mapping can come from either the original geometry or the reference geometry. And then of course you can use things like bump mapping and normal mapping and all of these things have to work, which was uh, a little tricky to get right. Um, what I mean by rays being curved is, uh, you can see here on this slide, this, the top row is actually images from the original 98 paper, where you can see that we can take a, a blocky piece of geometry and then uh, if you put it on a surface that has some uh, warped normals, you get a curved result. And here I try to illustrate that the ray that is a straight line in world space ends up being curved in, in the UV space. And it's like intersecting geometry with curved rays. That's not easy. The way we solve it right now is just break up the ray in multiple straight line segments and uh, hope that this approximation is good enough. And usually it is but uh, I don't really like, uh, we're probably making too many steps right now. So uh, that's an area that I want to optimize a little bit more for one of the VRA6 updates. And um, we did the feature, um, it ended up in the VRA6 beta. Uh, people seem to really like it. One of our users posted this um, piece of cloth with some intricate texture details. And this would be really, really hard to do with uh, in any other way. Like doing it with actual geometry is uh, prohibitive. You can do it with texture maps, like opacity maps, bump maps, but it just doesn't look right. Um, using Vuri and Mesh gives a really very realistic result. Um, and yeah, you can see that the final image here. And it's just not possible to get this in any other way. So I'm really happy that the code is out eventually and that people can uh, make use of it. Um, another of the popular feature for VRA6 is the sky clouds that we added to the VRA Sun and Sky system. Um, this project also has a somewhat interesting story. We knew that we wanted to add some kind of cloud solution to VRA6, but we weren't sure how to approach it. And back in 2021, we started looking into how we can possibly do this. Um, it was a topic for the uh, hackathon uh, that we do every year. We do this hackathon um, with developers from different offices. Uh, back then, it was only uh, the Prague office and the Sofia office. So developers from uh, Prague and Sofia get together to work on, on various um, problems. And this was one of those uh, things that we wanted to look into. Uh, the final implementation ended up uh, being the, the clouds that we have in Enscape, but um, it doesn't mean that we just took them directly. Uh, here on the left, you can see the experiment that we did at the uh, uh, hackathon, a very simple uh, program to do the uh, experiments with uh, various cloud-like textures and how we could possibly render them. Um, we knew right from the start that we wanted a solution that's simple and intuitive. We didn't want people to play with uh, noise textures uh, or adjust fractals or anything like this. We wanted really simple and intuitive controls. We wanted this to render quickly. So we knew that there is just not enough. Um, we couldn't use a full volumetric ray trace solution for this. It had to be some kind of cheat. Let's put it this way but still the results had to look plausible. Uh, they still had to look good in an image. And we wanted this to work not only in one product, not only in Vera and Corona, but also in other uh, products that we have like Vantage, Vision, and so on. 
And we realized there are two approaches we could do this. One is to use some kind of real-time solution. Uh, there are a number of these uh, real-time cloud systems that are used in games. Uh, there are papers out there that uh, uh, people put together. Um, or we could take another maybe slower approach where we could do um, clouds the way products like, like Vue or Terragen do them and then maybe bake the result into a sky dome and use that for rendering. Um, but when we try to picture a workflow with a baked sky dome, we quickly realized that it's just not going to work very well. Maybe it could be useful in, in Vue or Corona, but for a real-time solution like Vantage or Vision, it was just definitely not going to work. Um, so um, at the beginning of this year, the merger with Enscape happened and uh, Enscape has a very good cloud solution that people are pretty happy with. So we thought, well, maybe that's something that we could potentially use. Um, they do fulfill all of the requirements, uh, but we weren't sure whether we can actually port them over to an offline render like, like V-Ray. Um, but uh, we took a look at the code and uh, we did some experiments, which you can see here. Uh, it was a separate uh, like prototype program that we used to see if we can uh, make the clouds work uh, in C++. Um, and it did happen. Uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, I remember I chased a bug where I had just skipped uh, multiplication by some number in some formula, and I couldn't figure out where the problem was, and all the clouds were coming out pink. Um, and that took me like maybe two days to figure out that I just missed a, a negative sign somewhere. And I had to read all the papers that the original clouds were based on to figure out what the right formula should look like to realize that I had skipped a, a negative sign. So that was fun, but um, it was done and the code worked pretty well. Um, it was a little bit tricky to get it working with the, with the dome light in V-Ray, but eventually we solved that problem as well. And then, um, the Vantage team, the very GPU team, they also did their own implementations of the cloud. Um, so eventually the goal is to have them working everywhere and look the same everywhere, including including Escape. Um, we didn't port all the, the features that Escape has, like we didn't get to the moon and the stars and the uh, condensation trails. That's something that we left for an update of, uh, Review A6, so there are more things coming out there. One thing that I didn't actually expect was that uh, they will work so well with other features in V-Ray, like uh, the volumetrics uh, that we have. Here's a, this is an image that a user posted on our forum, um, which uses the clouds together with uh, volumetric scattering. I didn't really expect this to work, but surprisingly, uh, it kind of did. There was a bug originally, but once the bug was fixed, everything was perfect. So that was super cool to see. Um, random topic number three, support for HDR monitors and um, TVs. Uh, for some, some time now, HDR displays can be uh, found pretty much everywhere. They are well supported on various operating systems. So um, one of our developers, Radoslav, uh, at our six month planning uh, mentioned that that's something that he could probably look into. Um, and I said, well, okay, uh, go ahead. Um, he mentioned that Vantage might be very easy to do because it's based on DirectX and DirectX does have built-in support for HDR. So that's where we did this experiment and it worked really well. Uh, here uh, on the images, Radoslav took the picture of a, like a photograph of the same, um, HDR uh, OLED TV that we have in the office with the same exposure and the results are really quite impressive. And of course, a photo doesn't mean much. You actually have to see it, uh, but it looks really, really nice. And now that that works and we know that uh, it's a good feature to have, we will probably be looking into adding support for other products like Kios Player and the frame buffers, uh, like a frame buffer in V-Ray. But that's a little bit further into the future. Uh, random topic number four, VRA for Blender. Um, yes, that's still a thing. Um, we have been working on it for the past few months, bit by bit, because the developer that works on it also have uh, has other 
tasks, but um, we managed to update the code base to support Blender 3. And we also uh, finished uh, an experiment that uh, Andrei Zrancev, the original developer of Vehicle Blender, did a, like a few years ago to support interactive rendering in Blender uh, by porting the whole uh, renderer to use the V-Ray app SDK, which is basically a higher level um, programming interface for V-Ray that we use in products like V-Ray for Cinema 4D and V-Ray for Rhino and SketchUp. Um, and that seem to be a better approach than using the, the lower level C++ um, SDK that we have for products like Vero for 3ds Max, for example. So updating the code base for all these things took a while, but um, finally it's uh, done. Um, we don't have builds that are ready for people to use yet because we still have some issues that we need to fix. But so generally, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel and uh, things are progressing, progressing quite nicely. And yep, that's it. Thank you.